The Bluest of Blues, Anna Atkins and the First Book of Photographs by Fiona Robinson. 1807, The English Meadow. The sky is the bluest of blues. Little Anna's arms are full of flowers. Buttercups, forget-me-nots, corn cockles, love in a mist, fever few, and marigold. The air is thick with butterflies and bees. Father carries a jar of clamoring insects. A heavy book weighs down his coat. Anna finds a poppy. She wants to keep the poppy forever. Father passes her the book. She opens it and places the poppy on the pages. She closes the cover, pressing the flower flat. It will dry there, between the pages, preserved for her to examine later. Father claps in delight. The Laboratory When they return home, Anna and Father examine the insects. He is a scientist and has a laboratory in their home in Tonbridge, England. Aside from experimenting with electricity and chemicals, he is fascinated by entomology, the scientific study of insects. He has thousands upon thousands of them. Anna gently curls and twists her hand as a tiny spotted beetle skitters around and tickles her fingers. Father explains that although this insect is small, it has dozens of different names around the world. In England, it is known as a ladybird. In America, it is a ladybug. The French call it a coconelle, the Japanese a tetunmushi. But Father tells Anna that the specific many species of the ladybird family all have one specific scientific or Latin name, coconelle didae. This naming system was created more than 70 years before, in 1735, so that scientists from different countries could discuss their research with less confusion. Latin was the language chosen to label every plant and animal in the world. Father's name is John Children, but his only child is Anna. Anna's mother died soon after her birth in 1799. She is his beloved child, but also his partner in research. She, too, is fascinated by collecting specimens to name and study. On this day, he lays her flowers on a table and sifts through them, observing closely their different leaves and petals. Father is determined to give his daughter the best education in the world at a time when few girls receive any schooling at all. He will teach her the sciences, chemistry, physics, zoology, botany, and biology, and, of course, the naming language of science. Latin. 1811, Beside the Sea. The sea is the bluest of blues. Anna finds a long strip of squeaky, bubbly brown seaweed. Fucus vesil vesilicus, says father. Fucus vesiculosus, says Anna, repeating the Latin carefully. She takes the seaweed by its roots and swings it high above her head, momentarily. She sees it silhouetted against the bluest of blues. She places the seaweed with her other treasures from the day. Seaweeds, bladder whack, kelp, Irish moss, dead men's bootlaces, landlady's wig, shells, razor, periwinkle, limpet, cockle, barnacle, cowrie, scallop. There's driftwood, too, and dogfish eggs that are also called mermaids' purses and cuttlefish bones that the birds feast on. Anna takes out her notebook. She draws and records the seaweeds, bubbles and baubles, tendrils and roots, frizzes and wrinkles. Father helps her label them with their scientific names. Anna is a treasure hunter. Anna is an artist. Anna is a scientist. 1823, Flowers and Shells. By her early 20s, Anna is a botanist, a scientist of plants. Botany has become a very popular pastime. Hunters of rare plants enthrall the British public with their tales of scientific adventures to the most exotic corners of the world to bring back specimens. Magnificent greenhouses are built to grow the tropical treasures collected. For Anna, botany is her job, her life's work. She doesn't travel the world finding plants, but she has become a highly skilled collector and recorder of British specimens. She uses her skills as an illustrator to create images of the natural subjects she and father collect. He gives Anna her biggest job yet. He has just translated articles from French scientific journals into English. Titled Lam Lamarck's Genera of Shells, the series is a guide describing and scientifically labeling shells. 
but something is missing that would greatly improve identification. Illustrations. He asks Anna to help. On this day, Anna holds a long curved ridge shell. It's an elephant tusk shell from the Philippines. It will take her several hours to capture it in pencil. Anna's drawing must be as perfectly lifelike as humanly possible. An engraver will copy her image onto a printing plate for publication. She has more than 250 illustrations to complete. 1825, Love and London. Anna marries John Pelly Atkins and becomes Anna Atkins. He is the son of the former Lord Mayor of London and a wealthy merchant. They live in London near her father, who now works in the Natural History Department at the British Museum. Father is a busy man, although he tries to see Anna most days. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of London for improving natural knowledge. The society holds lectures and publishes papers on everything new in science, thermometers, comets, meteors, exploding rockets, magnetism, geometry, disease, longitude and latitude, the circulation of blood in insects, tides, everything. The society is an important meeting place for scientists to discuss their work, but women aren't allowed. Father recounts important lectures to Anna. He passes on papers to her, but when will she get to share her knowledge of the natural world with the scientific community? Anna dedicates herself to creating an, an herbarium, a collection of dried plants. In a room filled with large storage chests, she uses a flower press to flatten and preserve seaweed, lichen, ferns, and flowering plants of the British Isles. It is a massive task. Each individual specimen, once flat and dried, is mounted on paper and placed in a drawer for protection. She is proud of her herbarium, but it is not accessible to a wide audience. Illustrating and publishing it would take far too long. Her seaweed collection alone amounts to over 1,500 examples. Anna thinks if only there was a quick, accurate way to copy her collection. In 1839, she is granted membership to the Royal Botanic Society in London, one of the few institutions at the time to admit women. It is a great achievement. 1841, the gift. When father retires, he, Anna, and her husband John move to the Kent countryside together. Father takes up astronomy, studying the night sky, but he and Anna share a passion for a new invention. Photography. For Anna especially, it is a wonderful combination, part science involving the use of light-sensitive chemicals and part art involving the careful composition of a subject. One morning at breakfast, father places a wooden box on Anna's lap. She turns it around carefully. There's a slot at the top and a hole in one side where a circle of glass sits. A camera, one of the first ever made. Anna and father spend many hours together experimenting. It is both exciting and hard work. The word photography literally means drawing with light. Most of their endeavors require the strongest source of light known to people, the sun. None of Anna's early photographs survives today. The prints faded over time, like memories, but she is now acknowledged to be one of the first women in the world to take a photograph. 1842, the bluest of blues. The gentleman opening the door to Anna and father has wild hair and a boa constrictor draped around his shoulders. He is Sir John Herschel, the most famous scientist in England, and he shows them into his laboratory. While he is known as an astronomer, Herschel has a far greater passion for experimenting. He especially loves to test the effect of sunlight on chemicals. His work is essential to photography development. Anna listens carefully as Sir John introduces his most recent discovery, the cyanotype print. This process doesn't need a camera, just two chemicals, paper, water, and strong sunlight. It is quick and simple, and the final image will never fade. Sir John explains that the prints will always be blue due to the chemicals used. He uses the process to make copies of his astronomy notes. But Anna, inspired, sees a different purpose for cyanotypes. She can't wait to get home and experiment. In a dark room, Anna coats paper with a mixture of ammonium iron citrate and potassium fer ferrocyanide. She takes the paper outside and lays it down to bathe in the bright sun's rays. 
She arranges a piece of seaweed for her herbarium on the paper and places a sheet of glass on top. She waits a few minutes. She removes the seaweed and soaks the paper in water. As if by magic, the seaweed appears, white against the bluest of blues. Every bubble and bobble, tendril and root, frizz and wrinkle is visible. Father claps in delight. 1843, Anna's Book. Anna gazes at her seaweed cyanotype, fascinated by its detail. The blue background reminds her of the sea, the plant's natural habitat. She finds the image more truthful, more scientific than any illustration she has ever seen. She has a brilliant idea, a book, a book combining the science of botany with the realism of photography, a book of her seaweed collection. No longer will it lie hidden in dark drawers. No one before has ever published a book of photographs. She will be the first. Anna waits for the brightest of days. Some days father helps, some days her servants help. But the best days are when the weather helps. Only the sunniest days will activate the chemicals, and rain is all too frequent in England. As Anna has so much seaweed, she decides to produce several volumes to document her entire collection. She will label each type of seaweed with its Latin name, so her work will be seen as a serious and useful endeavor by fellow botanists. In all, she will make about 2,000 prints over 10 years. The first book is completed in 1843, when Anna is 44 years old. Father is lost in the stars. The door opens and Anna enters, smiling and offering him her completed book. He gently turns the pages of photographs of British algae, cyanotype impressions. He sees the dedication. To my dearest father, this attempt is affectionately inscribed. Father is proud of Anna's achievement. Her work is both scientific and beautiful. Over time, he sends Anna's books to the Royal Society, the British Museum, the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, Sir John Herschel, and many other scientists. At last, her hard work is alive in the world. 1852, The Poppy. The sky is the bluest of blues. The air is thick with butterflies and bees. Anna drifts slowly, alone, through the tall grass. Father has died. A flash of bright red catches her eye. A poppy. She closes her eyes. A distant childhood memory sharpens into focus. The poppy from that day with father in the meadow long ago. She wants the poppy to last forever. In the dark, she coats a piece of paper with chemicals. She takes the paper outside and lays it down to bathe in the sun's rays. She places the poppy on the paper and places a sheet of glass on top. She waits a few minutes. She removes the poppy and soaks the paper in water. As if by magic, the poppy appears, white against the bluest of blues. Anna's poppy cyanotype still exists and can be found in one of the greatest museums in the world, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London.